Dames are always pulling a switch on you. When Dana Andrews delivers this line in Otto Preminger's Laura, I gotta admit, I groaned while rolling my eyes. I've seen Laura at least half a dozen times. I've been lucky enough to even see a nitrate print of it at the Egyptian theater, where the gray hues that overlap black and white sparkle with a crystalline silver that's so beautiful it almost brought a tear to my eye. Laura is a highly exalted bona fide classic from Hollywood's heyday, but it's a film that I often struggle with admitting if I actually enjoy or not. And Detective Mark McPherson casually reducing Laura to a dame helped me pinpoint why. Despite my personal feelings about the film, this rewatch proved fascinating simply because of how themes around current topics like pretty privilege, incels, and men's desire to control women seem to leap off the screen. Rewatching Laura highlighted how these issues aren't new. They've simply continued to fester for nearly 80 years. This became all the more evident through the contrast of McPherson and Waldo Leindecker, played brilliantly by Clifton Webb. I imagine that if Laura were remade today using all the less fun words that men call women, then this picture would have a much more dire theme at the core of its story. As a quintessential film noir, Laura's legacy looms larger than its place among the halls of film noir, a celebrated stylized era of Hollywood crime thrillers that emerged into prominence at the height of World War II and into the 1950s. Garnering five Academy Award nominations after its release, Laura went on to earn preservation status by the Library of Congress and deemed a film of significant cultural and aesthetic importance. Sometimes I watch Laura and find myself laughing out loud at its sharp wit. Trundle him off to the Who's Gal. You keep out of this. But you'll look nice in bracelets, Carpenter. Why don't you get down on all fours again, Waldo? It's the only time you've ever kept your mouth shut. And I'm utterly enthralled by Vera Casperi's original story. It's a thrilling whodunit filled with twists and turns, and I still find myself trying to spot visual clues that would answer the mystery of who murdered or who we later learn attempted to murder the beautiful and successful advertising executive, Laura Hunt. Was it her fiance? Her mentor? Her fiance's spurned lover? Was it Laura herself? Suspicions abound and intrigue is high. But more often, when watching Laura, I can't help but feel frustrated and irritated by the cast of characters we follow. They're not all villains, they're just suspects in this murder case. But the audience is meant to recognize that they aren't good people compared to Laura and McPherson. Our two leads are characterized by their virtuosity and their good moral standing, an aspect of their personas meant to evoke audience allegiance. They're supposed to be set apart from the lineup of manipulative, wealthy elites who are selfish and indulgent in their behavior. But I find Laura and McPherson just as morally questionable as the rest of the characters. They may be worse because they think themselves better. McPherson, true to the noir era cynicism of a hard-boiled detective archetype, is dry and stoic, but seemingly fair. Dana Andrews attempts to play up these elements of McPherson, but his performance comes off stiff, making McPherson an entitled man who now wears a chip on his shoulder because he's been jilted by a woman in the past. Now that he's fallen in love with Laura, or the idea of this woman, he expects loyalty from her, and for no other reason than that she's beautiful and that he wants her. And therein lies my issue with the film. But simultaneously, that's where this film manages to stay so relevant in our current conversation about men, women, and sexual politics. The screenplay revolves around a murder mystery surrounding a group of sexually frustrated, entitled men who think that they have claim over this woman. But the film's screenplay reveals an underlying lack of awareness to this. The screenplay focuses on how these men recollect their feelings about Laura, never once interrogating those feelings or how they negatively affect Laura herself, despite how revered she is in society. Laura is beautiful, a woman that undoubtedly benefits from what we refer to today as pretty privilege, or opportunities and benefits granted to her simply because of her looks. When Laura first meets Lidecker, he's misogynistic and off-putting, and she tells him so. But because of her beauty, he's struck by her and he can't stop thinking about her. So he makes amends, then takes her under his wing, helping her rise up the ranks professionally and socially. It's fairly evident that Laura is aware of this, and re-watching it allowed me to read Laura as a self-aware woman playing the game for survival. McPherson and Lidecker have the authority to make or break her career and her freedom. 
but the inability to acknowledge this power leads these men to become bitter towards women. McPherson boxes Laura into the category of dame, insisting that they're always playing a game and making a fool out of him. We hear men from podcasts, YouTube, 4chan, Reddit, all over the internet say this all the time, never once owning up to their part in this social game. Laura has promised McPherson nothing and owes him nothing outside of answers about the murder. She doesn't know him. According to the script, they've only known each other for about two days. But because he's fallen in love with her, or more accurately, the idea of her, he expects loyalty and love from her. The Laura he knows is only a fragmented woman whose existence is pieced together by the men who desired her most enough to have a motive to kill her. And yet, McPherson's toxic attachment to this woman he's hired to avenge is never interrogated. He's allowed to be pestilent, pouty, and passive-aggressive to Laura, all because she doesn't immediately return his emotions that he feels he's owed from her. McPherson is so emotionally unintelligent that he isn't even aware that he's fallen in love with Laura, but once it's brought to his awareness, he doubles down on his desire to control her. On the other hand, there's Waldo Lidecker, who has all the trappings of being an incel or an involuntary celibate. Lidecker is spending all of his free time fixated on Laura and her personal life. Laura has promised Lidecker nothing and again owes him nothing, but she extends her time to him in the form of friendship. Because of this, Waldo himself feels that he loves Laura, and this misconstrued idea leads to obsession and a desire to further control her. He begins tampering with her personal life and becomes emotionally abusive and manipulative. Similar to modern day complaints from incels about women, Lidecker detests that Laura likes men who aren't him, even telling her, If McPherson weren't muscular and handsome in a cheap sort of way, you'd see through him in a second. And yet, Lidecker hasn't made himself vulnerable or honest in his feelings. Instead of appreciating her friendship, he only wants to own her and will stop at nothing to do so. Shelby Carpenter is the only man not using his power to wield over Laura, which is likely why she wants so badly to love him despite knowing he's not a suitable match. In franker words, he's trash. And while he doesn't use his power to wield it over her, because he doesn't have any, his desire is to use her fame and glory for his own benefit. Shelby doesn't love Laura for who she is, he merely loves her for what she can do for him. He continuously abuses her faith in him because he's selfish and he wants to have his cake and eat it too. All of these men want something more from Laura, something she never agreed to give them. They simply see her as a prize to have and expect her devotion in return. And what frustrates me is that the film doesn't see this as a bad thing. In fact, some of these men are rewarded for their behavior. The screenplay, written mostly by men alongside Elizabeth Reinhardt, expects perfection, moral correctness, and honesty from no one else but Laura. And while it's hard not to fall in love with our heroine, thanks to Jean Tierney's stunning face and fantastic portrayal of her, Laura proves to have the same foibles as the elite social climbers around her. She may not be like Lidecker, insulting people of different classes and backgrounds to their face, but she does uphold the class systems in place in the most jarring, but admittedly, unintentionally funny ways. Case in point, Betsy. Poor, poor Betsy. Now, I won't go too much into Betsy for risk of spoiling more bits of this movie than I already have, but in short, she's Laura's maid who has gone through hell and back because she's the one who discovered what she believed to be Laura's dead body. Laura has a lot packed into its 88-minute runtime. And because of the times, the screenwriters couldn't produce a screenplay with the kind of robust social inclinations that I'm referring to. I usually despise remakes, but I think Laura is the type of film that is ripe for remake if written with the elements of class and sexual politics in mind, but with a gentler touch. I don't necessarily enjoy Laura as a film because I don't like any of the characters that we watch on screen, except for Shelby Carpenter. Vincent Price plays him with the right amount of charm and self-awareness and he's just fantastic. But as a crime thriller, it's truly like no other. It's a great story with a dazzling cast of actors that should be seen. Considering I will always watch this movie when given the opportunity, despite my own annoyance with it, goes to show they really just don't make them like they used to anymore. But what are your thoughts on Laura? Do you agree or disagree? Let me know in the comments below. Please like and subscribe for more content like this.